You've been living in the States for about two years now. How have you been received in those two years? Well, I haven't been out in the big world very much. I've been living pretty much in this little uh, house uh, in the trees in Woodstock. Wood shedding, Woodstock shedding, wood shedding stock. And um, because it's a period of um, contemplation, really. When I first came here, I did that misbegotten retro gong tour. I say misbegotten because I wasn't at all behind it. I wasn't really interested in playing that music. Um, I found it rather boring. I mean, it was obvious you got to see it was music three uh, three years old. I hadn't played it for three years or something. It was part of a whole former cycle. But I, I had this sort of feeling that because it had never been played in America, and there's a lot of people who are into the trilogy, that I should uh, play that uh, music, form a band and play their music for, the, for their sake. But it certainly wasn't for my sake. And I, I didn't, by the time I got halfway through the tour, I was really beginning to regret that I'd even done it. Um, because, you know, the kind of music that I was more inter interested in was not really that. Um, as soon as I'd finished that tour, I therefore went into, uh, got into the situation, you know, into the, into this place up in Woodstock. I started working on the New York Gong album, which was more what I wanted to do. It was more of a new wave, a concept. Um, because, uh, as far as 1977, I'd been involved in punk and, and really interested in punk. And it's quite a, a weird thing to do to get really into punk and then do a kind of uh, a three-month tour of uh, a fusion from 19... whatever, 74 or 73, uh, which ori originated in that time. And really was a relief for me to get into the back into New York Gong and make the New York Gong album with the Zoo Band. Um, but after that... Uh, you know, it was interesting too, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was to get down to the Divided Alien Clockwork Band, which is the stuff that I've been doing in the last six months or so. And uh, But that that requires working in the studio. It's not so much of an out out in the, the, the performance area. It didn't occur to me, why not make the studio into a performance area? You know, why not bring the studio out into the, the halls? And so... Um, I started doing gigs of this kind, just taking parts of my studio out, setting it up, and, and working on the tapes, and proceeding with work on the tapes in public. People seemed to like that, so the concept of the clockwork band, or the magnetic band, came into, uh, into reality. Where was the best audience response on your last tour? Um, this was one of them. Um, L.A. was pretty strong. Do you mean the tour of the Retro Gong? Yes. Yeah. L.A., um, Cleveland, uh, uh, Chicago, um, Baltimore, Yeah, I think that were, they were the strongest places. Yeah, they'd be the strongest places we played, I think. Why do you think they were centered in the large urban centers? Um, well, because there's, I think there's a stronger pocket of that. I mean, there's still a lot of following for this music. and I, My involvement with it dates back to 1974. That doesn't mean that that style of music stopped at that time. It's been going on and developing. You've got National Health... Uh, and uh, you've got the Bruford Band, and you've got all these bands that are continuing in that tradition, pretty much, and developing in that tradition. The use of jazz. Um, but what always w f I found weird about the whole fusion thing was the fact that it came from the States originally. It was black music originally. It um, then influenced uh, um, some American and some European, white European, white American, white European musicians. The white European musicians then developed their own thing from it, and then it was re-imported back into America. <laughs> That's really how I really you can say it. You know? It's like it's gone from gone from its roots in America back to Europe, and then a certain American young American musicians have considered that to be good and have re-imported it. But there's no mention of like where it originally came from, because jazz is black music. Mm -hmm. To me, it was always black music, and uh, my heroes were all the black musicians, you know. 
not the white fusion musicians. And I always find it's very strange to have white fusion musicians held up as examples of the craft, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In fact, you know, the last is really a, a one, once removed, and they're all American anyway, you know. So that's pretty funny. Christian Vander, for example, of Magma, who's an excellent drummer and everything, he learned from Philly Joe. No, no, it wasn't Philly Joe, it was Elvin Jones. Elvin Jones. Uh, his, <coughs> thanks, sir. His, uh, his inspiration, oh, his mother and father, they were musicians in Paris, and um, they used to be hosts to all the, the jazz musicians. And Elvin Jones used to stay with them. And he, as a kid, learned from Elvin Jones. I think he's probably one of the few white guys that ever learned from <laughs> Elvin Jones. Elvin Jones took him, took over in a very paternal way and, and um, taught him the drums. So he's an excellent drum player and he comes from that black tradition, but it's, it's, it's kind of weird when you get, I just get this funny, funny feeling, you know, when white, white, young white American musicians are getting inspiration second hand. Obviously the Euro rock thing, has a particular atmosphere and has been, it's a readaptation of, of jazz and fusion and so on. I tend to think it's confusion though. See, I, that's for the reason why I call it confusion or even infusion perhaps on a politer day. But, uh, yeah. Well, it's definitely not your, uh, straight jazz. No, but it's really not a heritage either. I mean, the blues is not my heritage at all. I, n- I, I never play the blues because it's not my heritage. You know? Jazz is not my heritage either. I play jazz because though my my heroes were Sonny Rollins and Thelonious Monk and people like that because their music turned me on so much. But even so, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it was my heritage. I'd say that I borrowed that as one of the elements in the in the kaleidoscope of uh, you know my musical uh, interests. But certainly, alongside with jazz, there would go Indian music and Balinese music, all the all the traditional. Um, ethnic musics and then Australian folk music Aboriginal music if you like and then there would be uh, uh, all kind of, all the variations of Irish real music I mean you, I, whatever wherever there's music the only thing I don't like really is country blues country blues I find very offensive I don't know quite why wow. I guess up in Woodstock everyone does country blues and it drives me crazy every time we go out for a drink somebody's playing country blues in the corner I can't stand it <laughs> A lot of your music is heavily influenced by gamelan music, especially Balinese gamelan music. I'm wondering why you haven't really expounded on your use of that music in your in your style. Which uh, parts would you say were influenced by gamelan music? Stuff from the trilogy. Well, especially the trilogy. We well, see that was um, possibly uh, the influence of Pierre Merlin. And also floating anarchy, uh, and of yeah. course, wise men in your heart from uh, the Good Morning album. Yeah, but what? It's not so much gam- gamelon specifically. It's it's that what interests me is that kind of uh, um, uh, fast flow of of notes which are kind of close together, which create a pattern with their overtones, which is like a continuum. Um, uh, I've come close in this divided alien. There's one piece in the divided alien, cl- clockwork band, like that, where I've been, where I was playing notes on a. Uh, there are a semitone apart, and I think a couple of, which are a quarter tone apart, and this kind of carpet of continuums, and they're all. Uh, overtones and uh, the overtones that occur it's very hard for me to explain this because it's a new concept the overtones that ex- uh, occur are a bit like glissando in some curious way they create a carpet of overtones on top of that which to me is rather like the music of the spheres I mean basically all I'm trying to do is to chase this idea of there being a music which is the sound of planets rubbing together it's called the music of the spheres which is something which the physical ears don't really perceive it's something which the inner ear perceives um, it's like the, uh, the clairvoyant or audiovoyance or quite what the word is but it's like the equivalent of clairvoyance but in terms of listening and uh, the music of the spheres is anything I can any sound I make which starts to sound like music of the spheres I'm after it like a dog after a, 
raggy bone, you know. And I, uh, in this particular, it's not so much gamma. I suppose in gamma, gamelon music you can hear this feeling, but I wouldn't say that, that gamelon music interests me per se. What interests me is, is that continuum of, uh, of ryth- rhythmic, rhythmic continuum of notes which are related in a certain way to create a, a carpet sound or an overhang which has a, a curious magical quality which can uh, lift up your your art and soul uh, Pierre Merlin was very much into gamelon and I've always considered ballet to be the centre of the music centre of the world musical world musically I think that their music is the highest and most developed music the, ba- the Balinese music and the theatre and so on I, th- I think it's incredible I've never been to Bali but I guess Maggie's going to get me to Bali at some stage great she's a great. veteran traveller and uh, I hear that getting back to what you're involved with right now this tour seems to be very concerned with spreading the history and ideology of Gong did you find a lot of people were missing the depth of your music and that's what prompted this well, you know, I'm not so keen on this history thing. I didn't really want to do it, but I think it's because so little is known about the Vida Daddy and Clockwork Band that everybody I spoke to about it seemed to grab hold of the history and magnify that as being the important element and not talk so much about the uh, Clockwork Band because they didn't know what the Clockwork Band was and they, ha- and they had no way of describing it to anybody. And so they said, oh, it's David Allen's going to do the history thing. But actually, in a way, I wished I hadn't even mentioned the history thing because I don't, I don't care. I mean, I'm not really that interested in history. I'm sick to death of the history, as a matter of fact. And to go on for an hour and talk about it, you know, it's really like how many, how many hundred times have I done already? And I should think that people pretty much must know about these things now. And if they don't, well, <laughs> can use their imagination I don't care I'm not I don't believe in facts I think facts are the idlest of the superstitions Richard Burton the traveller once said that facts are the idlest of superstitions what are facts you know they're somebody's fantasies and so I get up there and I rave on about my fantasy of what happened and everyone said that's the truth it's not the truth I mean the truth is what whatever anybody wants to make of it whatever they feel they need to make of it any any kind of history history itself is a complete uh, misnomer as far as I'm concerned it just, history doesn't exist history is one man's fantasy that's all you can say based on certain kind of uh, coded uh, information mm-hmm. but uh, you know that each of us will perceive that house in a different way and describe it in a different way and each of us singly on different occasions during the day will also describe that house in a different way so how many different ways they describe that house the endless ways of describing that house so the whole of history, the whole of written history, is a complete load of, uh, load of uh, phantasmagoria, isn't it? So therefore, my vision of um, Planet Gong and um, the whole thing is completely open to question. Uh, it's, it's my particular personal fantasy. It's what I probably what I wanted to make of it more than what I did make of it. Uh-huh. But it is your development. It is my development. It's the background. I suppose it's interesting to see that, but. And I'm always kind of surprised when people want to know that because we're in the here and now and what's happening is the here and now and this music that I'm making is apl- applicable to the here and now and all the other music was applicable to the there and then so let's move on and, and not yeah, leave too many footsteps Yeah, but it still steps. exists on pieces of plastic yeah. I mean, you know, people are sure, still yeah. playing and, and wondering yeah. what the, what caused the man to make this music and such Right, yeah, so that's the reason why I do the history thing but really I'm... I like to think that I'm more in the here and now than the there and then. You discourage the use of all mind-altering drugs. That's a pretty strong and unpopular stance. Maybe strong and unpopular, but it's my what I the conclusion I've come to from having spent eleven and twelve years uh, doing those kind of drugs, and got to the point where. Like in that song when sex and drugs and rock and roll just ain't enough for you. I mean, what do you do, you know? Uh, and also, you know, we're living in this country of consumerism, you know, and, and drugs are another form of consumerism. They've become the, uh, the imperative of the bourgeoisie. People used to think that drugs were really, uh, like far out and kind of revolutionary and stuff. They're not. They're just another kind of bourgeois imperative that you buy in head shops, all the paraphernalia in head shops. It's become a consumer item. And if one really is going to take open for the people to heart, and if one is really going to try and change the world, then one has to see that 
One has to strip away everything that one's depending on. And what's so curious is that people are into health food, for example, and they're into alternative society and culture in so many ways, are still utterly dependent on, them, like this really heavily dependent on this one outrageous consumer item, which is, it's outrageous because the profits that are being made on it and all the stuff that goes with it, the kind of uh, atmosphere that, that hangs around it and so on, none of it is at all furthering, finally, you know, if one is really trying to go into a new world. It's something that uh, one has to buy and one has to hustle and one has to score and one has to have paranoia about because it's vaguely illegal. And also there's the other element that because it's vaguely illegal it becomes more uh, sort of colourful or more kind of... Uh, uh, it's more of an adventure, you know, exciting or something like that, but less so now because who's going to bust you for dope now? I mean, there's not too many people. I mean, everyone smokes outrageously. You know. Well, I used to find that when I first started smoking dope, it was about 1960, it was, it was kind of outrageous and nobody much knew about it and it was a real exciting thing to do. It was like a big adventure. Um, but now I, I really see, well, yeah, okay, smoke dope, but let's not you know, give it any outrageous claims. It used to be uh, capable of expanding consciousness and giving people kind of spiritual direction. But it's like counterfeit money, you know. I mean, it looks the same. The experience seems the same. But it's really super misleading, and it takes you right along the wrong path. And people who get hooked into dope after the first experience with dope can just, you know, endlessly go up their own... Uh, their own uh, <laughs> spiraling up their own uh, how can I put that without uh, having you shut down <laughs> uh, spiraling up their own uh, basic cavity shall we say <laughs> because it's not <laughs> what is it you know it's like uh, it's a big hallucination see what I'm really interested in is is spirit and there's a lot of other people that are interested in spirit, okay? The people that are interested in spirit and are doing dope, they're not interested in spirit, they're interested in what dope gives. And this is the problem, you know? And all that time that I was in spirit and I was doing dope, I can now see super clearly that what I was seeing was what dope, was dope hallucinations. I was not seeing spirit. There's only one way to do spirit, and just nothing can help you do spirit. Nothing can help you get to spirit. Anything you use to help you get to spirit will distort spirit. And dope is one of the biggest things to distort spirit. It really is because it's so close. It gives you the impression that you're there and you're so far away, just so far away. And so I just say with a heavy heart, you know, to all those people that, that are on the path of dope spirit, man, it's sad because, it, you know, you have to strip everything away. You have to not be a consumer. You have to just start with nothing and be in a desert with no clothes, no food, no water, and above all, no dope, and get there all by yourself with no crutches, no first aids, no nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, if you're just going to use dope to um, amuse yourself or <coughs> to make life seem more spectacular, more colourful, more dramatic and stuff, okay, it's exactly the same as gin and tonic, you know, except it does more damage to your subtle bodies. It does more. Is that? It does more damage. Is yeah, it? it does more damage. Well, it's been proven by people who do psychic research and, and even by certain enlightened doctors that alcohol being a much more um, unsubtle and obvious kind of a drug, um, before it does you that much harm, makes you sick, physically sick. So you're there, you've got these warning devices built in. I mean, there you are throwing up in the garden or something before it actually starts to attack you psychically. But um, particularly hash or coke and all these things, they, even acid, they don't make you sick, they, but they can make cause your aura and all your subtle bodies, your etheric bodies and so on, but to be feeding back and blowing out and collapsing and expanding and doing all these alarming things. And there's, not, there's no real sort of physical... Um, noticeable physical aftermath, you know. So that there are people doing this and they don't have anything to stop them. There's nothing, they're not in the garden throwing out. There's nothing to revolt them and make them realize what they're doing. So therefore, you know, you can go much further with these things, but they can also blow out your 
your, the things you've been given to protect you, and so therefore you get these people who believe they're God, you, people who uh, believe all kinds of weird things, and they're just screwed up, and they're in a, in a complete dream world, hallucinating that they're what they're not, and so on. And you can see it's like form of possession. It's like they don't have any protection left against the elements around them. They're on a on a kind of a low level half the time, and on a high level the other half the time. And everyone would like to believe they're on a high level all the time, but they say things which are so alarming that it couldn't possibly be coming from a higher place. It it's tremendously confusing once you get into the realm of dr- drugs and um, mind expansion. It gets very confusing and very dangerously confusing because it's so hard to tell you know where what's coming from where anymore you don't have control and in the end i'm a control freak you know if i gave up dough because i just i couldn't stand this feeling of not knowing you know what was happening to me i would be behaving in weird ways and i couldn't really understand it why, why i was behaving like that think why the things i was saying why i was saying them you know i wasn't in control i was somewhere out there you know and i i think this was a good thing i just think it's like automatic writing or like being a shaman or something like this, you know, that there was something uh, in psychic history which justified uh, doing this kind of thing. But uh, when it came down to reality, if I could actually put my feet on the ground and look what I'd been doing, there was nothing to be proud of and there was nothing particularly good. I'd get stoned and I'd entertain myself and I'd have a great time and I'd think I was being wise and I'd think I was being perceptive. But if I had a tape recording of myself or a video of myself doing this and I looked at that straight, I was just making an ass of myself. I was entertaining myself. It's the, it's the height of selfishness, though, because what do you do? You get stoned, and everything you seem to be saying and doing seems to be to you, to who else? To everybody else who's stoned, maybe. But if anybody's not stoned, if anybody's just that naked st- person with no food and nothing in the desert, which is like a, trying to say this is kind of reality of the human race as it's born, looking on, that will look just completely crazy. It will look like distorted consciousness. You make one more major statement, I think, with Gong, and that is with your Gong philosophy. It parallels religious ideas very closely, and like you, know, you wear a cross. And uh, I'm just wondering how the Gong philosophy differs from a religious philosophy. Well, well, I suppose it doesn't really differ. One is trying to provide a structure for. Um, for people to uh, make the bridge between the soul and the personality, as one does with religions, you know. But uh, at the same time, one wants to make the structure as invisible and as lightweight as possible, because so many people get hung up on on the structures of religions, you know, and then get lost, locked inside it, in the same way that people get hung up in the rituals of smoking dope, for example, which is a, a whole ritual in itself, too. And ritual in itself... It seems to be very sticky matter, something which you get your feet stuck to. And uh, what one is trying to do is just use ritual, the minimum, you know, as a ladder to get to build that bridge. Um, sure, I mean the 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 idea of Gong, the structure of Gong, is is uh, on its highest level, a kind of religious structure. But you see people hung up on the gong structure, as Maggie says, um, quite hopelessly. <laughs> and so I begin to wonder, you know, and that's another reason why I think that the gong thing is why I, I want to move on from the gong thing, because I made a lot of mistakes with the gong thing. It's certainly by no means perfect in any respect, and I, I, it was my learning process of how to kind of construct a, something like that for people to use. I think it can be done better. Um, but there it is, for better or for worse. I studied comparative religion for many years, and, and what you do when you do that is that you come to the conclusion finally that all religions are one, you know, and that uh, the sort of basic ground rules behind all religious organizations, you know, which, uh, which uh, carry, which act as a kind of a ladder or a structure for people to get to a stage where they don't need them anymore, basically. Any kind of religious structure is for people to make the initial steps so they can get to a stage, for example, where they can meditate and get much higher and in a much more controlled and much more uh, <coughs> clear way than with dope, for example, or by going into 
Catholic Church and getting drunk on the ritual or whatever. You know, this, they're all ways of um, of getting yourself into a state where you can function as a, as a soul on the soul level, uh, and that that's extremely important state to be in. That's before we can start talking about the future world, about what's on the other side of the supposed cataclysm. Um, we have to reach a stage where we are in control of our soul, where we have built the bridge between the soul and the personality. Right? Once we've built this bridge between the soul and the personality, then really where we've begun, right? But until that point we haven't begun. Now religious structures are there in order to help us build that bridge. There's an awful lot of distorted and screwed up religious structures because people attach their egos to that structure on the way. And you get people like Jim Jones or Hitler or or uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say Pope John Paul. <laughs> but I d I don't know, I don't know about Pope John Paul. I'm sure he's a good guy, you know. But I don't really respect that much religious structures, and I'm not very interested in religions anymore. I'm interested in perhaps the mystical offshoots of them, the Sufi uh, aspect of uh, the Arab religions, for example, um, or the mystical English uh, extensions, theosophic extensions of the Christian religion. Um, and there are these people that um, uh, hung up on the structure of ritual of gong thing but certainly that's not the way one should be one should be free of it one should use it and throw it aside I guess the one thing that's really come out on this tour uh, rather than the thing that happened in New York and last year's uh, tour or a year and a half ago whatever and what I've picked up from the albums is that uh, there's a lot more to Gong than just the music. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing that's coming out on this tour that you're on right now. Yeah, except that it's all in the music as well. I mean, you can just listen to the music, and ideally you should be able to get it all just from listening to the music. And, um... <laughs> yeah, a lot more to music than Gong, yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so, do you find yourself a cult superstar? Geez, I hope not, man. That's the last thing I'd want to be. I mean, I didn't want to be, even have be involved with a cult, much less a superstar. Geez, the last thing I want to be is a superstar. I hate superstars. I hate that whole superstar thing. I've even got that poem there: "Ashes to ashes, lust to dust, deodorant death." to the superstar's crust, you know, and it's like this horrifying crust which gets built around you or which you build up around yourself, um, which uh, has nothing to do with you, you know, it gets projected on you. I'll do anything to destroy that at all times. I mean, I think you can see pretty much, if you know much about what the way I've handled my scenes with bands, I've tended to jump off whenever that kind of thing started to develop and do the opposite thing as much as possible. I really am devoted to the cause of, of not being a superstar. And um, the cult thing is not dependent on me. It's not I that make a cult. I just have these ideas and put them to work in a certain way. And if people then get hung up on the structures and turn me into some kind of cult figure, there's not much I can do about it. I, all I can do is accept it and try and use it for the best possible purpose or else reject it. But it's not much good rejecting it because they are pretty tenacious, you know. They'll, they'll keep it there anyway. So I figured the best way to do it is to just try and uh, keep it light and keep it as uh, absurd as possible, <laughs> you know, not to get too serious. And and try and use it as a way to help people, you know, kick the structures. Have you ever heard of or done any work with the rock and opposition movement in Europe? Sure, yeah. Well, n when I made an Exist Power, I made that with Chris Cutler. He was playing drums on that. And Chris is sort of very involved in the rock and opposition movement. And um, so, to that degree, I've been involved in it. But in a way, they don't quite approve of me because, I guess, of the religious overtones. Because they're very much a political organization and, and the kind of politics which doesn't recognize even the existence of spirit unless it's put into terms which are totally uh, practical. So... It's pretty marginal, my connection with them. Uh, but I can appreciate what they're doing. And a lot of the music that comes in that thing is very, very fine indeed. I'm a great fan 
of Universe Zero that I heard some tapes recently um, of uh, some work that uh, Chris Cutler and Fred Frith did with Universe Zero, which was very, very similar to uh, one of the pieces that I was doing last night. So I feel a real connection with them uh, musically, if not totally ideologically. Very good. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you again. You know, I hope you get around and, and play some more. I was well, real, real pleased to be able I've to finished my uh, wood shedding, wood stocking uh, period. Now I'm going to be out in the world, sort of doing more things, and I'm going to LA to uh, to work with some video equipment and to um, work on a computer there. Um, making music with computers so we're moving over to the west coast because that's where the action seems to be taking us and also it seems to be taking us out of our shell I've made these two albums the New York Gong and also this uh, Alien Clockwork Band which is going to be called Psychic by the way when it finally comes out it's the title of the album Um, in the last year or something like that so I feel I've done my done quite a bit of work and I'm ready to um, come out in the world I'm going to to find some kind of new deal American record company or distribution so that the records are available here because it's a complete catastrophe what's happening with Charlie Records in England there. Um, the distributors here, especially the distributors on the East Coast, are not very friendly towards me and uh, don't seem to make any effort to get my records out. So they're very hard to get. New York Gong is extremely hard to get. Haven't, I haven't got one myself even from Charlie. Really? And very few people seem to have found them in the shops. I wish that, you know, that, that extended to me. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is that, uh, uh, I, it's, I reached the end of my contract with them anyway. And, um, so it's time for me to really start working on getting a, a whole thing going in America so that, um, the, the whole American gong, well, the American alien, whatever, cycle is now about to begin in earnest because I'm now going out into the world with the things I've been doing the last six months. In the marketplace. I started hustling for myself, which I haven't done yet in America. So hopefully within a year we'll start to be able to get things and get information and they'll be much more organized. Good. And more, many more gigs of various different kinds. Good. Good. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure.